That's me. I'm Aristotle Full Throttle, and I'm here with Corey, Tay, and Nathan. And we're going to talk about Star Wars The Last Jedi. We're going to do a full-on spoiler review. And I'm going to have to mute my computer in one second. But what, guys, what did you think? <laughs> I love it. I just hear you coming from I know. the computer. It's beautiful. First thing. I don't know if they can hear the echo, but they probably can. They, you don't think so? Um, I'm yeah. going to take care of that really quickly, but first of all, what did you guys think about Mary Poppins' Princess Leia? Mary Poppins? Wait, Mary Poppins' Princess Leia? Oh. I, I missed that part. <laughs> right, no. Oh, I mean, oh, oh, the fly, oh when, she's, she... when she's flying, like like the umbrella. Right. And nobody's old enough to remember that. Like, that, <laughs> that dates everybody on this couch. Right. Uh, no. like, that's, that's like the 35 and older type they reference. Are, they are yeah. coming out with the new Mary Poppins. <laughs> with Emily Blunt. They Emily, are? Emily Blunt and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Oh, my God. oh okay. Well, he's good. But yeah, he's like, he playing the... Like, Miranda movie. being involved <laughs> almost kind of like, it apologizes <laughs> for the fact that it's a remake. Like, okay. That's true. I think it's going to be at least decent music for that. Yeah. And now so, that now that we've covered Mary Poppins, <laughs> yeah. I'm curious well, if he's going to try the bad Cockney accent though uh, from Spanish. Do you think so? Maybe he's like maybe they'll do like a version that's uh it, that's like um what's the musical Maria? Uh, what's Maria girl name? Um, uh, 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 West Side Story. West Side Story. Maybe they'll do like Maria. What? I once met a girl named Maria. And suddenly we got back to the stream. The Mary Poppins theme. <laughs> um, I was enjoying that, actually. I was like yeah. thinking, you know, this this took a, a great turn into a musical. Yeah, we you should just... be at the Christmas concert next door. <laughs> I know. I, 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 yeah, I, came, the hell? I, I came to the wrong door. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the, I, I tweeted this today that, you know, the force kind of became a Harry Potter sort of magic where they were like, whatever we need to happen for the plot here, it's, the it, it's just the force is yeah. going to be the reason. And I right. was actually okay with it. I was okay with it because the cinematography is strong, the characters are strong, the writing is strong. So it's kind of like, you know, fine. Mary Potter, I mean, yeah. it, I thought it was kind of cool because that, that was not the only uh, force scene with Leia. Like right. when she came back yeah. onto the bridge after Poe was kind of doing his mutiny thing, yeah, she that door just kind of like... Pfft. She blew I mean, open. she kind of like had this force push or something. She's like yeah. an incredible Hulk fit. You know? I, I like the egalitarian nature of the force, this idea that yeah. hey, the kid can, the little kid who can do yeah. it with the broom, that like everyone it's has not different... a bloodline thing. Yeah, it's, it's not just a bloodline; yeah. it's just there. Some people may be more talented than others, right. but that almost kind of moves the Star Wars narrative, where it's a little bit more like hey, like the Superman narrative, where it's like hey, everybody from this planet has this ability. Yep. he just happened to end up on Earth, and like, but like it's normal for him right. and the people who are where he came from. It, this is kind of like breaking Star Wars into this notion where yeah. the Force and Force abilities are a little bit more normalized and shared. I like that well, idea. I think they hammered that idea home, especially when Luke was training Rey for the first one of the first lessons. He was like, he's like, "What's the Force?" And she's like, "It's a power that Jedi have." And she and he's like, "No, wrong. It's it exists it, between everything." And like they sort of like they're backpedaling on that whole midichlorians idea which i can't stand yeah. i think they're just sort of so bad. they're really hammering home that the force is a separate thing and it's not a special power that that just jedis have but they went back to the prequels people. sorry <laughs> <laughs> you, you did have a setup way back in the prequel things where there were a lot of jedis and we don't know how and why they had their powers they right. just did mm -hmm. and uh it's certainly true that probably everybody has the ability to tap into this uh, in our particular story with the Skywalkers uh, their bloodline is just dictating that they have a stronger sense to tap into it right yeah well I mean I feel like for me it, just, it was never really any, any question that uh, they were like oh your dad is a powerful Jedi so you'll be a powerful Jedi it never made me think oh it was because of his this par like this parasitic organism inside his blood no. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it was just like oh of course yeah, well your dumb. dad was good at that so you're you might be good at that like a carpenter yeah, exactly. Shaq played basketball his son plays basketball it's just gonna I think we all thing. liked when Obi-Wan Ben Kenobi said it's just this all-powerful thing around us and does binds us and whatever yeah and we didn't really need any physical like organic explanation that it was like, some well, like yeah controlled just like by some other organism Right. Yeah, because like like in the original films, it's much more of 
which they touch on very heavily in this film, I feel, like a religion almost, yeah. as opposed to like a scientific explanation for something. Yeah, it's yeah like, like, like that discussion of New Hope, where it's like, you know, you know your sad devotion to that ancient religion it doesn't you know, let you conjure up the stone mm-hmm. data tapes. It was kind of like, there was this sense of, it was like a monk, like a sect, like a religion, like a... Something that could uh, be taught, something yeah. that could be like through discipline learned instead mm-hmm. of just, you know, being born with. Which explains like the reason Han was always like, ah, it's a bunch of hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. Yeah, but also that it had some controversy, almost, I mean, I had to say, bring up like Scientology, but like that, that it was a specific um, the thing. That, yeah, that like, yeah. It, that you know, some people might have bought into it. And like Han Solo in, in A New Hope is like, well, you know, uh, fancy magic, it doesn't uh, equate to a blaster at your side. Like, he was very dismissive mm-hmm. of the idea. Right. That, uh, uh, whereas now it's. Uh, um, I, I, I just like what I, I think they've tied because there's been some conflict in the past and what the status of the force is and what it is yeah i think they're tying it together nicely i think so too i think also um i mean bringing back you were talking about uh, obi-wan during that scene when when yoda shows up as a force ghost did you guys i was thinking watch obi-wan also like jump in yeah i was waiting for that and then like you know some old man like you know who's supposed to be like anakin yeah. shows up <laughs> and then they're all sort of trying to convince him to stop destroying but I guess I kind of like that Yoda I, 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 I think in the most basic sense Ryan Johnson is smart enough to realize that Yoda was probably the only character he could legitimately put in there yeah. and get away with right? <laughs> yeah. he tried to put in an Obi-Wan does he put in Alec Guinness who it would be some sort of weird CG Alec Guinness <laughs> or does he put in Ewan McGregor that makes us all be like why isn't it Alec Guinness <laughs> yeah exactly like I think though it, it would be forgivable to put in uh, Al, uh, Ewan McGregor in maybe I, old person old well the scene yeah. need it was so serious and dreary on that planet it needed comic relief it did yeah. so Yoda was brought in large I mean in part for the comic relief Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and and you know those little furry things, you know that scene where Chewbacca is eating one, and the other one's the porgs. That was looking on, really uh, yeah. looking like, um, It needed that type of comic relief. That um, yeah, you know, you mentioned comic relief, and that was something that I felt more strongly was present in this film than any other Star Wars film. Mm-hmm. I think as so far too, as yeah. like. You know, like the gags with you know like the Luke brushes off the shoulder a little bit. That was, you know, that was cool, that was actually. Good. I like the pickup from uh, from from uh, Force Awakens where Ray hands him his lightsaber and he immediately just throws it behind him and walks away. <laughs> yeah. Or where Kylo kind of, like, you know turns on the lightsaber and or catches a lightsaber and and you know oh, goes wait, to the uh, when yeah, that was the the the, uh, the uh, Snoke's guard. That was yeah. dope. That was actually really cool <laughs> use of. That that scene alone was amazing, actually. Uh, but but getting back to the let's let's talk about that beginning with, with Ray handing the lightsaber over to Luke. So yet Episode Seven, where the whole movie's building up to find Luke Skywalker. That's basically mm-hmm. her mission, mm-hmm. their mission, and she goes to hand him this thing, and it's this big moment at the end of The Force Awakens, and then it's just tossed aside <laughs> in this yeah. movie. You know, it was really perfect because. Because he didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. So he's not going to just take it and be like, I don't know who you are or why you're handing me this, but I'm going to go fight the Empire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> that's true. It is this. time. I came here to escape it. Yeah. Leave me alone. And and that's a big theme in this movie is like getting rid of the past. And mm-hmm. like getting... Let the past go. Exactly. They said it, it really a couple is. of times. Yeah. So they said that. They, Kylo Ren says that. Get, the Sith are dead. The Jedi are dead. Let it all go. Let the, re- the rebellion die. And we'll take over, start anew, mm-hmm. and and I almost feel like that was like Ryan Johnson's purpose in a lot of the. the it's almost like cha- it's almost like channeling yeah. the voice of Disney, where it's like they're like, okay, yes, we have to close this <laughs> franchise, we have to close this story arc before we can start in a different, uh, uh, you know, part of the galaxy or different to trilogy. So yeah, I thought it was an allegory for the Disney Fox merger. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was. It, and then they brought in the X Men right yeah. at the last minute. Uh, but again, so that scene with Snoke when uh, Kylo Ren kills Snoke. Spoiler alert! Spo- I mean, this is a, it's this, a spoiler. This, it's a spoiler everywhere on this review. No. But um, thoughts? Because let's go down the line here. You know, I thought it was. I wasn't a huge fan of it because, like, this all-powerful being that we know really nothing about, but can you know set Ray and Kylo on like this. <clears throat> 
this plane where like they can see and you know converse with each other and touch yeah and like he knows like the conflict within them and like he can move them around like chess pawns to like get his desired goal but he can't realize that you know next to him the lightsaber starting to twitch and turn and move over a little bit right <laughs> i thought that was a little strange uh -huh. but you know, I like that they went ahead and took care of him, so you didn't have a Return of the Jedi moment where it's, you know... Expected. Yeah. yeah. Like, the third movie is the confrontation with uh, Snoke. Yeah. I actually liked that scene because Snoke had his eyes closed, and because the Force can only show you, you know, like, a nebulous image of the future. So mm -hmm. he didn't really... So he could sense that he was going to kill his true enemy. So he had his eyes closed and he was trying to focus on Kylo Ren. So that's why I think he didn't okay. notice. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, the, the consistent thing in terms of practitioners of the dark side of the force who are killed or injured is that they are very focused on injuring or overcoming a light-sided foe. That's mm. consistent with Anakin when, you know, he gets maimed by Obi-Wan where he's very focused on... on uh, uh, in a fight that's consistent with Palpatine where he's focused on electrocuting Luke. So yeah. I thought that the, the way the Snoke died, um, that that's kind of, it, it, it continues that critique of the perhaps the tactical or psychological flaw of being of the dark side is being able to hyper-focus and, um, you know, maybe so full of rage and so operating it for an emotional place that you miss something obvious like, yeah. uh, oh, by the way, <laughs> There's this lightsaber sitting here. <laughs> and if you remember, the Emperor himself couldn't quite tell if it was going to be Anakin or Luke who was going to be his uh, yeah. successor. And then he was so Anakin. focused on electrocuting Luke that it's like, oh, well, Vader was able to pick him up and throw him away. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that might have that might have been something that Ryan Johnson was going for in that moment. Yeah, I have but. two two thoughts on that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, first thought the grander picture is that they've been setting up this Snoke guy to basically be the Emperor and he's kind of our ultimate villain and they played with this feeling that maybe Kylo Ren's gonna end up being a hero maybe Rey's gonna end up going to the dark side and he's kind of the puppet master in between it all so to kind of dispatch him in the middle of this film was yeah. shocking because mm -hmm. now things have kind of twisted away from what we've been expecting. Yeah. Well, secondly, on a, a much uh, shallower level, you see that, like you were saying, you see the lightsaber kind of twitching off to the side, and you get the feeling like it's going to fly across the room into Kylo Ren's hand because we've seen that happen right. in Star Wars so many times. But it doesn't. It just sort of ignites and just slices right through Snoke <laughs> like butter. And that was like the most creative use of a lightsaber with the force I think that we've seen in eight movies. And, and it's and yeah. it's paid off in that moment because it cuts through him, cuts him in half, and then Ray catches it. Catches the lightsaber immediately falling. Yeah. I also think this is a critical moment where Kylo's character is differentiated from Darth Vader. Mm. Uh, because it, there's almost this moment where if Snoke is a sort of me too or stand in uh, for Palpatine, uh, or, or you know, similar type of character. Then and and uh, Kylo is this character who wants to be like Vader. Um, then it's kind of like Vader was never really able to stand up to Palpatine until the end. Mm -hmm. Vader was never really able to kill Palpatine or to bring himself to uh, act on that conflict within him. Mm -hmm. And this is a place where Kylo is differentiated, being like, hey, Kylo is still very much in conflict in yeah. this matter. Yeah. And to a point where he is able to act on that right. and kill his master in a way that Vader really wasn't able to until yeah. Kylo Kyle wants to be in control. And he's but he's reckless too. Yes. And that and that was a reckless move of him, but he did it anyway. I don't know if it was reckless. I do agree with Tay. Uh the thing that we never saw from Vader was Vader like taking that step to become the supreme leader. He was always even though he was our main villain. He was always second fiddle. Well, he, and Kylo has now like he took that step to be like, hey, you know what? Fuck second fiddle. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be the guy. I'm the man. Mm -hmm. 
Well, not to get too deep into Darth Vader's psychology, but his original plan, at least in uh, Return of the Jedi, was to use Luke. Say, hey, partner up with Luke, and right. say that Take he needed over. he needed Luke to destroy the Emperor, uh, and uh, he because he lacked confidence in his own ability, he lacked a he felt internally like he was subordinate or not able to defeat the emperor mm -hmm. and so that luke was a necessary tool for him to achieve that and then when that plan failed when luke did not comply then he felt unable to be independent so i think that's kind of a again it just highlights the difference between vader's psychology of subordination versus kylo's psychology which is in a different place mm. um and i think that kind of goes in you know you can tie that deeper to the metaphor of Vader feeling constrained in the suit and inadequate and all these other things uh, and, and kind of not so it, it's good to see that character differentiation yeah. between them especially after episode 7 where it was all about Kylo idolizing Vader right mm -hmm. and, and, and well Robert Medina in the chat room is saying um, it seems like they're setting up Kylo Ren to be like the next Darth the new Darth <laughs> Vader Darth Ren I mean it's it, it's pretty much I feel like they are and they aren't so he's going to take fill that role but in a different uh, yeah, capacity. I, I think the yeah. scene where he smashes his mask was kind of us, kind of the way of saying like, I'm not just a Vader clone. Mm -hmm. I'm a whole new villain. Yeah, yeah. No. And I'm not afraid to show my face. Right. No. Or I like my that. humanness or humanity, I guess, if you will. Again, that was goes into the theme of like getting rid of the past because he's and I think there's also Ryan Johnson sort of realizing that Adam Driver is a really good actor mm -hmm. and he shouldn't be behind a mask an entire movie. Yeah. Yeah. Also, it was so, it, it was a choice for Kylo Ren to yeah. wear the mask and it was not a choice for Vader. Like that was his life support. Right. Yeah. That's why he's like get rid of that ridiculous <laughs> thing, and uh, and he took it and he smashed it to bits. I thought that was cool. It, it does raise a question in the Star Wars universe. Maybe y'all have an answer from other places, but like. We haven't been exposed to many Siths or uh, Dark Jedi, as it might be. <clears throat> right. We got Vader, who was wearing his mask and outfit because of, uh, like you said, health necessity. We have Darth Maul, who looked cool in some cool ass makeup with some horns, but we don't know why. Then they killed him. Yeah. Had no, no yeah. Yeah. Him. He was so cool in the case. Now we've got Kylo Ren, who's obviously uh, coming from like a fanboy perspective, right. mm -hmm. but we don't really know all the rest of these other. Dark Jedi, why, why, or why they don't have right. these particular looks? I, I was, I was, I was uh, interested in seeing what they do with that, as far as like uh, the dark side users, and because it was called the Last Jedi, it seemed as though they were going to sort of, just judging from the uh, previews and stuff, like shift gears. I mean, in the preview, Luke Skywalker says to the Jedi, "It's time for the Jedi to end." Mm -hmm. So he's like, "So are we like, are we going to go with a new kind of?" Force user? Or are we gonna go with like I know that the extended universe or has the Bendu or the it's, I think it's canon actually, um, which is like a different. It's a gray Jedi, someone who uses light and dark side yeah. well, of the Force. Also tactically, you know the uh, the what are they seven uh, different lightsaber forms and uh, I think Mace Windu is known for was it form seven, which is the idea that like you can dip into the dark side right uh, in order to, and that's why, you know, Mace was kind of able to equal Palpatine, at least when, when they fought, is that he's, mm -hmm. he was able to dip into that, uh, d to some extent. Um, I really liked the critique of the Jedi Sith binary, and, yes. um, mm -hmm. I liked the deeper ethical critique. I like it as being tied to a metaphor of, why the galaxy ended up being corrupt, political yeah. corruption of the military industrial complex uh, in the galaxy and why the Jedi uh, were not able to counteract that. Right. Uh, I really liked that larger ethical narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and that's true. I mean, it's like, come on, the Jedi couldn't do it? Like, what the hell? You guys suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I thought that was, uh, that was interesting too. Um, but they sort of doubled down on the idea of the Jedi at the end, that they were going to bring rise to the new Jedi Order again. And it almost seems as if they were going to use Leia as the spearhead for that, as sort of this combined general of the Rebellion and also a Force user who is also a mentor to Rey. Um, which I guess they're going to have to like sort of figure that out for your episode. Yeah, no, I, mean, I honestly, I expected <clears throat> Carrie Fisher to be killed off. Me too. In this. Yeah. yeah. And... They had three very clear opportunities to do it, uh, and 
they passed on each of those. I mean, e- even even without disrupting much of the movie's plot, they could have knocked her off at the end, mm. um, you know, toward the end. Uh, and yeah, you know, she's still there. Uh, I mean, fantastic job, but um, it does kind of raise the question of what are they going to do in episode nine? Yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I I liked to see her using the force. I liked to see her uh, again. You know, going back to the Mary Poppins scene. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, that. But that was um. It was. Oh, go ahead. Because, oh no, I was just going to say that. Um, I guess you can you can sort of write your way around anything, and uh, the they were. They're gonna have to do that for episode nine as well. It doesn't as Leia as say specifically in Return of yes. the Jedi that I, I can't do what you do. Well, like she says to Luke that I could never do what you do, and the and Luke says yes you can. Yeah, like they have that specific conversation about Leia's force abilities. Yeah. Uh, My father has it. I have it. Yeah, My sister has it. it. Sister. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so we got a call we, coming in. We, we've all watched a lot of Star Wars here. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're still like, we go back to sister now. We're still concerned with who, who is Rey and who are her parents and is, is she somehow related to this uh, Skywalker clan? Right. And uh, that, I, I that actually enjoyed that. That wasn't answered in, in any fashion. You can say that it was uh, when, when uh, Kylo Ren tells her that. Uh, there's nothing happening. He's mm-hmm. seen her parents, and they're nobodies. They just left her. But right. that's not necessarily the truth either. That's true. Uh, actually, we've got a special guest skyping in right now, Corcon. I don't know if we can. You probably see him on camera. I don't know if they can hear me or not. Uh, we can hear you. Know? Yeah, we can hear you. So I got the volume all the way up. Uh, so we were just talking about um, Ray's parentage, and I actually thought that it was really cool that. Even Kylo Ren says straight up, he says to her, you don't belong in the story, you come from nowhere, you're nothing. Yeah. And I thought that was great because I didn't think that she needed to be a Skywalker. I didn't think that she needed to be. Well, it fits a lot along with the narrative drive of the story to like make the Force a more universal thing. Right. That's And I thought that was great. I thought that... Uh, so did you have a, a comment about that also, Cor- Corcon? Yeah, I mean, it's a co- core part of the story is they're trying to show, like where Snoke had said, with the rise of your uh, being evil, that the rise of light will come to match. But they don't know where that would come from. He thought it would be Luke. It actually became Ray. Right. The fact that her parents are nobody, um, they kind of also reflected that with the Finn and Rose storyline of you can be a janitor, you can be a mechanic, you can be a slave and still become important. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that was And it. then they show the kid at the end who has the force and he grabs the broom and he's sweeping and he's dreaming of uh, becoming a rebel. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. all to show that it doesn't matter where you come from. You don't have to have important parents to be important yeah. Yeah. as long as you have the drive. Yeah, it's, not a, it's, it's not a genetic thing. It's not a eugenic thing. Right. Uh, we're like the finest of the uh, finest star. It's it's it, or the domain of an elite thing, and that again goes back to a critique of the Jedi, who in many ways the Jedi Order sort of presented the Force as a privileged thing, as a eugenic thing that had to be very carefully cultivated by the most select people and the most disciplined practitioners, and it was dangerous to just you know uh, engage it willy nilly outside of that very rigid dogma. And so that's also in part a departure from the Jedi, and in line with what Luke's uh, you know position is in this film, which is that the Jedi need to right. die. And and that reflects the storylines of a lot of movies uh, or of stories in general. You know, uh, you can say, of course, that the Empire or the First Order they reflect the Nazis, and the Nazis felt the same way, and that their race was more. Uh, important and so everybody else should die uh, or you know if you want to go to other movies with harry potter voldemort saying that only true bloods and not half bloods um there's a lot of vampire stories out there where they talk about full bloods or the ones that were conformed that they're not real vampires right i mean it's a very similar theme with a lot of films that I could see that if you come from somewhere of privilege that people are going to treat you better 
Absolutely. Uh, and evil people are always going to have that mindset that I'm more important than you are because of this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, even with modern politics of like, you know, the class system and the 1% <clears throat> versus, you know, the every man, you know, we got to get rid of the poor people and help the rich. Right. So, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't really believe necessarily that she came from no nowhere. Uh, it could have been a lie. Mm -hmm. It could be trying to keep her from knowing the truth about herself. Uh, and that's yet to be determined because I'm sure the filmmakers are listening to things like this yeah. and using this information to determine whether or not they want to keep that as the truth or if they want to find a, a more interesting lineage for her. Well, because there's always kind of this non-canonical uh, canonical gossip that uh, uh, Anakin was somehow created by the Force or birthed by... The midi yes. the midi the midi right. came Born together. And he, was, yeah. he, he was immaculately conceived by the yeah. midi as this. Uh, I just never dug that. I never liked that. Ever. No, I never liked yeah. it either. I thought that was silly. Yeah, but um, I don't. I don't think that they're going to say that Ray has important parents just because it was so strong in this movie, and the fact that she was the one that first mentioned that they were nobody. It wasn't Kylo Ren. He yeah. just said, "You know the truth." You just uh, need to admit it to yourself. And she said, they're no one. Yeah. Or they're nothing. And then he reinforced it. But it wasn't where the psychology of him trying to convince her she came from nowhere. Uh, yeah. They just it, both kind of knew it. And it was, again, that, that sort of forget the past, let go of the past. It doesn't matter. We need to mm -hmm. move forward with, with whatever is But going. I'm also glad that they went that route because... So many people have been complaining about The Force Awakens being too similar to yeah. uh, Episode 4. And if you gave Ray's parents to be Luke, or in this movie they were trying to show that maybe her and Kylo were siblings by having that connection before Snoke came out and said, oh no, I just did that. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that if they gave her important parents in the third movie, it would take away from all of that. I think so too. I definitely agree with that, and um, and I, I like the way they sort of did that because I was in suspense actually when she goes into that little sort of that Darth Vader, the Luke Skywalker cave on Dagobah where he like confronts Vader. Yeah. It was sort of the similar yeah. parallel, and then she Flash sees herself, and I thought that was well done. And then the way that they had the two images of people walking toward the frosty. Uh, mirror, splintered mirror thing. Yeah, and just, they come together, and then she wipes it, and it's just her face reflecting mm -hmm. back at her. I thought that was well done. I thought that was a good, nice touch too. Yes. And I was in suspense. I was like, oh my god, I guess they're gonna reveal yeah. it right now. It was one of the more suspenseful moments yeah. for me in the movie. Yeah. Um, what What other standout moments did you like? Did, did What do you guys think of Crate, the planet Crate, with the salt and the red, the uh, dirt underneath, and visually, the... visually very cool, but. Uh, Ultimately, a, a, a slight bit confusing, maybe. Uh, I, I don't understand so. like the the point of yeah. having that like that and making the specific like, oh look, this isn't blood, this isn't snow, it's salt. Yeah. 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 Well, they just did it because it looked cool. <clears throat> it looked just because yeah. it looks cool. Yeah, because there was a moment where it was like they're kicking up the red dust and there's the blue sky and there's like the white. It definitely looked or, cool. Yeah. You yeah. got the trenches, and you got like you know the, the rebel soldiers in the trenches. Then you got the AT-ATs coming out of the fog, and it was a nice callback to the opening sequence of yeah. Empire. So, so, um, so, what about Luke's yeah. Force Kamikaze suicide apparition projection? <laughs> whatever happened there at the end that he like was able to materialize there, be acknowledged but, by everybody there, including the including you know C three PO and. Being able to touch Leia, like, yeah. you know, hold hands, yeah, and yet still be on his island at the same time. I think apparently. it was fantastic. I think it was a fantastic use of supreme master of the force. Me too. Yeah, that's what uh, I. That's I mean, how I took and it. maybe Nate touched on a, a slight uh, fault in the filmmaking, where maybe he shouldn't have been able to uh, physically touch Leia. But, but she's strong in the force too, so maybe that was maybe, that. Maybe he well, didn't actually connection. touch you could, her. You could and maybe argue she that knows that. He did not. He did not actually touch Leia. I don't think so. And that so, Leia yeah. knew that he was just a force image because right. he did the act of kissing her on the forehead, and she knew he's not here because I don't feel him kissing me on the yeah, forehead. Yeah, but also because she's—they're both so strong in the force. 
that maybe that's possible because earlier right. when it's Kylo and and Ray, there's a when, when she's on the island, yeah, uh, you know they're able to reach out and touch hands, and then Luke walks in yeah, and no, catches them, not actually yeah, touching hands. So they do set that up, and and I was, I thought it was also interesting the lightsaber the quote lightsaber duel between Kylo Ren and Luke. They never clash swords. They never clash he, sabers. I didn't he's, he's too good. He doesn't need to clash swords. Yeah, and I thought that was cool too because I was like, Matrix that I shit. was like, okay, yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> but it's because he wasn't there. But it's also because I was, I was like, yeah, Luke is not going to fight because he's above that. He's yeah. going to sit there and talk to him and try to figure out a peaceful solution. But, but Kylo doesn't initially know that he's not there, yeah. so it right. kind of it also plays yeah. into Kylo's naivety mm-hmm. and. Uh, an experience in the force. It also yeah. plays into our own naivety. Naive. <laughs> nativity scene. Nativity. We're so nativity. <laughs> also, we're we are a nativity also, scene right now with this Christmas tree right here. <laughs> because because they unleash all those blasts on Luke Skywalker, and then he just walks out of the and blast, and the like entire him. audience is that all was like, awesome. "He's so strong, yeah." He's past <laughs> him. And he's all, yeah, he's all. And yeah. nobody yeah. realizes yeah. that it's a, a Jedi trick. Yeah, like they even pulled one over on us. But that's the cool thing again about the Force that I always like about the Star Wars movies is that they always add a level to it that they didn't have that we didn't know about before. So every movie successively adds like another little wrinkle in the Force. Like this, the first movie had the Jedi mind trick. The second movie, Empire Strikes Back, telekinesis. He could move the lightsaber with his mind. They didn't have any of that in the first one. So and then the third one, I think it was like Force lightning. So every movie they sort of add a new layer to the force that we didn't know about and I thought I just looked at the force projection as only the Jedi Master Luke Skywalker mm-hmm. could, could do that <laughs> so he did sure yeah. I agree Yeah, I don't think the force has been explained to us in its entirety right we don't oh, yeah. know all of the possib- yeah. possibilities of the force yeah. and then Yoda and too. the masters don't even know the, yeah. all the possibilities they're still learning yeah I mean, Yoda, I would, is it, oh. go, go ahead, oh, Corso. Sorry, I was just going to say, if, uh, <clears throat> if the Jedi can die and come back as a blue glowy, why can't they just not be blue glowy <laughs> right. when they're alive? That's a good point there. In a way, he's kind of projecting himself the way he would in death as a blue glowy ghost, force ghost. He's yeah. just not dead yet. Yeah, and also yeah. that uh, perhaps it, it uh, aided to his death. Yeah, I mean, I just and they set that up earlier too when uh, Ray and and uh, uh, Kylo were talking the first interaction, and Kylo said, "You're not doing this; the effort would kill you." Mm-hmm. Oh, did they say that? Yeah, I never caught that actually. Oh, they did say that. Yes, yeah, he's right. Yeah, you're right, Corfman. Oh, that's that's pretty good. That's a nice catch, actually. Yeah, and that makes that makes perfect sense. And I, and I was as much as I wanted to see Luke Skywalker. In episode nine, again, I mean, we probably he will. will. He's going to be a force ghost, especially now that yeah, we can't have Carrie Fisher. Yeah, he'll be along with uh, the puppet Yoda. Yeah, with the puppet Yoda, <laughs> and maybe we'll yeah. get like a Ewan McGregor, an old person, old makeup. We won't get an Obi Wan. <laughs> we won't get an Obi Wan. <laughs> guarantee we will not get an Obi Wan. <laughs> maybe just a voiceover of an Obi Wan. Nah. No. No. Nah. How about Yoda's Zeus moment where he's just like, he's like, yeah, fuck the Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> like, like he just like comes down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I guess I mean that's another expansion of the force. The force ghosts can now right summon control matter. <laughs> we were yeah. talking summon briefly lighting. about uh, the amount of humor in this movie, and there was a good amount. Uh, specific, they really had those good, specifically really good... uh, the the Yoda moment. I thought really brought back like the Empire Strikes Back Yoda, where before yeah. we really knew he was a Jedi Master, and he he's was going through the backpack and hitting R two D two. And maybe his toying was funny. But when you look back on it, you realize that that toying was testing. Yeah. yeah. And that's why he's the ultimate Jedi Master, for sure. Like, his, he was, he's always... And he's got about 840 years on Luke Skywalker. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's pretty... He's been around. What I, liked, what I liked about the humor in this movie is it wasn't distracting from the story. Right. The, uh, the, hu- the, re- the problem we had with, like, Jar Jar Binks and some of the humor in the prequels was that it was integrated in characters in the story to where it distracted from the story. Yeah. For this, they were like very quick moments of humor, uh, especially the stuff with the porgs. They were just cute animals doing something cute at that moment, but it didn't distract from what was actually going on. Right. I did notice that like, even during the Millennium Falcon flying through the crate, the yeah. crystal mines, where 
the salt mines, you know, they're jumping up and down on the dashboard of the Falcon, and it was, it was cute. <laughs> chewing, yeah, you know, and and, and Chewie gets to be. Po- I mean, yeah. Chewie was always like you know down below when Han was flying. Yeah, <laughs> they give it together, but uh, it's the first Chewie. time Chewie wasn't Peter Mayhew. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah I was thinking about that yeah. actually. That's true. Well, the Peter Mayhew was paid as a Chewbacca consultant. Yes, in, in the credits, I was like, ah. Oh. Chewbacca should, should, consultant. It's just an interesting <laughs> thing to put on your resume. Maybe he say. just isn't healthy enough to play the uh, to actually yeah. go to work every day. Uh, no, no, uh, he's, he, he's got to be. He's old. not. They talked about that in. Uh, he had interviews and behind the scenes for the Force Awakens that um, he was in the suit for some of the sitting stuff, but he just isn't yeah. mobile enough anymore. Which is and, unfortunate. Uh, yeah. But he would talk to the guy that took his place, so that he could. Uh, properly reflect his movements mm-hmm. so that like his head movements his walking his stance his shoulders what he did with all of that was uh was the same and my favorite part about that was actually when they ask either uh, i think the guy's like a danish dude because he's like six foot ten or something mm-hmm. uh yeah. and when they ask him which scenes are you and which scenes are peter and he says guess because he doesn't want to tell. He doesn't want to say which yeah. scenes he's in. Mm-hmm. So, which was pretty cool of him to just be like. Well, if he's walking around, it's gonna be him. Yeah, exactly. Are you, are you saying that all Danish people are six foot ten? I'm just saying stereotypically, <laughs> you find tall people in that part of the world. Aristotle would know. I'm Danish. I'm, I'm a very Danish person, actually. I don't know if you could tell by my curly hair, uh, but yeah, it's. Um, what other what other moments were stand out for you? I actually, I, what do you guys think about General Hux being a punching bag through the whole movie? It makes sense with his yeah. character from yeah. the first movie. I, I'm a little conflicted about him. Yeah. I wasn't so sure of his place in the story in the first movie, he, right. and in this one, at least he kind of seemed to actually fill a a, a role he, of oh, being a punching bag. Yeah, um, but yet still. Uh, didn't get like just dispatched. He's still being used. I right. wish there were a few more moments where Snoke played them against one another because mm. I really enjoyed that dynamic of like you know clearly he's using Kylo to influence Snoke or not, to influence Hux, Hux to get him to you know to his will and then he's also using Kylo Ren like oh can you imagine you know uh, he he has an insult. I Which really enjoyed do, but, early, right. early in the movie, when uh, when Snoke like knocked Hux to the ground and like slid him across. That the was floor. awesome. Yeah. 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 Cool. yeah, he's like they're like Snoke's on the line. He's like, I'll take it in my chambers, and he just gets <laughs> smashed. <laughs> 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 or the uh, the the distraction that uh, Poe was doing. Oh, that was thought... like, oh, I'm that holding was... for General Hux. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Still holding for Hux. Mm-hmm. I do love that strategy that it's it's basically an X-wing with Poe Dameron piloting against a dreadnought. Just saying, yeah. listen, um, we we can do this the easy way, or you know, we can do it my way. <laughs> yeah, and then he just goes for it and just takes out all the cannons. And I, I thought that was a yeah. that was a pretty good opening. That actually. was that was one of the things I really liked that they didn't have in the other movies that. They showed the strategy and the purpose for the individual ships. Yes. Um, So like in previous movies, it was just a space battle. There were a lot of ships going, you know, fighting each other, but we didn't really have any organization. You didn't know where they were in the battle or what their purpose was. And in this, you got to see the entire field of battle. You knew where every ship was located and what the purpose was, you know, with him going in to take out the medium cannons so that the bombers could come in to take out the large ship and who is supporting who and why they're there and not just calling them support. So I liked getting the reasons for all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and exactly why the ships were in a stalemate for so long, mm-hmm. uh, which right. was a central part of the movie. They explained it tactically why that was the case. And I, I did, I, pre- I appreciated at least trying to Incorporate some rational basis to to some of the techno babble. Um, what did everyone think of the the Rose Tico character and kind of that uh, subplot? Where I loved her. I thought she was great. She was cool. She was I cool. liked her, but I think the storyline with her and Finn going to that uh, planet to find um, the code breaker wasn't really needed and Agreed. distracted. It was too mm. separate from the core story. Right. It I was disagree. You disagree? I do disagree, only a little bit, uh, in the fact that it was sort of, the whole thing was sort of a red herring. 
And it was a necessary red herring in the entire movie because we were trying to find this code breaker and we were trying to achieve this goal that ultimately was a, a goal that was failed upon. Yeah. But it wasn't a goal we needed because, uh, ultimately. But I think from a story perspective, we needed to feel like that was uh, a legitimate course of action. It also did introduce us to a character, Benicio Del Toro, who is undoubtedly going to be a, a larger part of the next movie. Uh, how so? Yeah, and I'm glad that he's in it. I I wouldn't cut those scenes out of the movie. I was just saying that her, those parts slowed down the movie. Definitely. Yeah, it did. It did feel a little. I thought it was interesting the I, use of BB-8 in those in, in some of those sequences. Yeah. Uh, hey, putting him putting him on his own. Uh, was it an ATST? That ATST. It was on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was pretty great. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, you're a lot of funny BB-8. No, I, I mean, I I also thought I mean the, the connection with her sister, her sister, you know, in the, the bomber scene at the start. Yeah, that was and, a beautifully and, done and, scene. And, and, the, great scene, and yeah. the medallion. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought it was just, it, it was yes, it was a little bit hokey the, the side plot but it was well acted right it was acting with commitment well and it was well imp- implemented so I kind of forgave the fact that it, you know it was a little bit of an optional detour right uh, yeah. um, I did like that opening bomber sequence though with uh, her sister mm-hmm. and you know sh- her trying to get that remote and it dropping and then it passes her and we're like and then it's the moment is turned again. I think Ryan Johnson did that a few times in this movie, where especially with like the Mary Poppins General Leia, where it's like she blew up, she died, and I thought that that was like it. I was like, okay, I'm ready to accept that that's the end of Leia. But then she's like floats back into the ship, and then is in the rest yeah, of the movie. You, you like, almost gotta uh, wonder if yeah. if but, maybe they retooled things, knowing that she had died in real life, and we were all expecting her to die in the movie. Right. That they made sure that she doesn't die in the movie because that's so predictable. Right. I never yeah. expected yeah. her to die well, because... Uh, from what I understand is she was supposed to have a much larger part yes. in the third movie. Yeah. And they had yeah. to rewrite all of that because she had died. They had already finished uh, everything in um, The Last Jedi. So that they didn't change anything in The Last Jedi because she died in real life. They had to change the third movie, though. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I, I think if I remember... From like an interview with Kathy Kennedy, like Carrie Fisher's talking to her, and she was like, "Look, you know, Harrison had his movie, and you know, Mark's got his movie. I want to be the main focus of the third movie, and yeah. she was going to be. Then, unfortunately, she passed away. Yeah, right. that that really did seem like it, that was the the direction they were going in. Um, but the the person who assumed command, uh, the Lord Dern character, I I, yeah. <laughs> I felt it was a kind of a flat character. I didn't really feel. I expected her to be with the First Order. Yeah, like a traitor. I think yeah. they sort of set it up a little bit, like a little nuance toward that. And you're like, why is she here? She's yeah. obviously not a good, as good a commander or a leader as Leia. Although, who else would you have acting oper- uh, opposite of a Poe Dameron type character? Like, you need that contrast. You need that yeah. um, sense of stability. And, yeah, yeah. But she somebody specifically some to problems. counter him. What was that? Sure. She also caused some problems. Like, right. a lot of the the mutiny thing wouldn't have happened if she had just mentioned that they were going to that planet. You know, Poe didn't know about the planet until after all of that was done, and Princess Leia showed it to him, and he's like, "Oh yeah, okay, that would work." Yeah, like why didn't if she just, she had say just this mention in the first it to place? him in the beginning, been, yeah, then it wouldn't fine. have been a big deal at all. Well, that's, at the same time, if he had just followed the chain of command. Yeah. But he doesn't. That's a, yeah. that's the thing between that he They know has. that he's not going to. Mm-hmm. That's what he has between General Leia and Poe Dameron is there is the dynamic that they both kind of break the rules and they don't, both don't follow the rules but they totally trust each other. Yeah. And they and they I wouldn't say totally thing. because Leia came in and, and stunned him. And yeah. stabbed him, so. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome though. She's like, you know, sit sit the f down. I'm going to stun you. Uh, <laughs> but that that was great. I loved loved that uh, Laura Dern's character, what she had done, but the sequence, the actual destroying of the fleet by jumping to hyperspace into 
yeah. a ship and then just a chain reaction destroying it. Like that was cool because it, we didn't need another Death Star, but it was cool to see an entire fleet destroyed. Mm-hmm. In that, in and that. I like the choice of, of taking out all sound. All sound, just, just completely yeah, silence. silence. Mm-hmm. All you the, really hear is the people in the theater going, oh! Yeah, yeah. The that, visual with the silence was really incredible. Yeah. I loved that. I loved it. I thought that was just like so well done. And it's because Star Wars is such a, like, you're bathed in all of these amazing alien sounds and like guns and engines and all of these things. Mm-hmm. And then and the John just, Williams score. And the score. Yeah. There you go. And then it's just nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I liked how the fleet battles weren't just about sensory overwhelming yes. uh, uh, sequences. Like, you know, they, everything had a specific purpose and they, it was more constrained, but it, it, it meant more. And yeah. when they said, you know, we're down to 400 people on three ships and then, you know, two of the last three get destroyed and they're like, they're really, you know, and, and by the end, you know, they're everyone's this, getting on the Falcon. Yeah, everyone's getting on the Falcon. <laughs> like, you, you, you really, it, it does a great job of numerically yeah. conveying the scorched earth. Complete um, depletion. Depletion yeah. of, of the Rebel Alliance. Yeah. Yeah, very much. That was, uh, I mean, where do we go from here? Like, what happens, I feel like this movie did a, there's a lot of finality in it, you know, like again with Snoke, killing Snoke and, and I, I mean, I thought that Finn was gonna die. I think we all did in that no. moment. And no. really, oh yeah, no, I, I did too. I, I didn't. Yeah, you didn't. I did you not. Why well, not? Think I... he was gonna die. Uh, he, he's too big of a character in the in the new trilogy. Yeah. And I felt well, ultimately he's gotta uh, continue on. Yeah. Uh, His story didn't feel finished. Yeah, correct. Uh, I I didn't necessarily expect Rose to live or die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Saving him. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Uh, (laughs) But, I mean... I look at it, and I think think a fact that can't be ignored, and it goes into their subplot, too, you know, Rose and Finn's subplot, is, um, I mean, it's good to see more minority characters receiving screen time yeah um, exactly uh certainly um uh uh what was, was the movie last year uh rogue one uh, rogue one yeah rogue one had had a lot of diversity Diego in it. Rivera. With, yeah you know, uh so it's kind of almost like you know Rose and Finn the both kind of, are, they're both well, they gotta kind of kill like, them first yeah it's like if they got <laughs> right. killed off it's almost kind of like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like come on come on we're, we're to, back to regular Hollywood now. I do have to yeah, say like, we gave was, you some diversity now we'll take it away we don't it's it. like it was it was a little bit check some comments um, here upsetting to me maybe I don't know upsetting might be too harsh of a word oh, is that? that they took that they still got two ethnic minorities together and there wasn't like say a white person and an ethnic person. Well, there, no, there's a kiss between Finn, uh, Finn and uh, a romance between Finn and uh, um, Rose. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a uh, bit of a romance. Muhammad, yes, but but I'm saying they're both ethnic characters. Did, did Finn so they, kiss Ray at, at any point of this? No, she did. They, no, they, they hugged. They hugged. They hugged. Okay. It was okay. interesting to me that like Poe and Ray finally met. It's, it's like, like oh wait, they didn't meet in the first movie. They that wasn't that actually and, kind of cool. Like you're like oh hey, and we're like at the end of the second movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is the first time we've actually we've actually met. <laughs> we're like the three main characters of the last one. Yeah, yeah and, and we realized the same thing. I was like, whoa, they didn't meet last movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Muhammad Ritsky says, did you guys realize that when Kylo versus Luke. Luke never left a uh, red salt mark on his feet, actually. I didn't notice that. Oh, that's yeah. a good call. That's but, true. Because when the they one... purposely show that Kylo was leaving red marks when he slid. Oh. They, they hyper-focused on his feet, but they never showed Luke's feet. I'm actually going to see it again tonight at 10. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so I'm going to look He's for that. the third time he's seen it. I'm going to see it a third time. I've got one for you. They never said the line... I have a bad feeling about this. Oh, that's <laughs> true. That's I got one. What's up? Do you guys notice how she stole the Jedi texts? I did see that. Yeah, she. Yeah. she I didn't them. notice that. She no. had them in the I, end. I, I, They're I, at the I, end I, when I, she's getting uh, a blanket out of a drawer on the Falcon to give a blanket to Leia. Like, like yeah. you see them just in the cupboard. <laughs> Page then, turners, they yeah. are not. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it just me, or has the set for the Falcon been enlarged in its current CGI manifestation? Uh, <laughs> I, I, the hallways just seem a little bit more spacious than. Uh, I have, I didn't notice. Different. I'll definitely take a look this time. But I, I mean, I love the the gunner sequences when they're using the the, the guns, the turrets. Also, yeah. how did how did she get back on the Falcon? From there was a line. She says like one quick line. 
I, to Chewie? Yeah, there was one thing like, thanks, I forget what it is, but there, I remember they took care of that. Actually. Okay. Yeah. I, I took a little offense with the fact that Rose and Finn were both on the ground about to get decapitated by some sort of laser sieve of some sort. And we cut away to something, and then all this shit crashes into the bridge or wherever they're at. And for some reason, everybody there has been destroyed except for Finn <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Rose. That was, yeah. that was a little... <laughs> and now a little they're Hollywood. safe. Yeah, it was a little Hollywood. Um, oh, it is a space opera. But going back to uh, Luke's force projection, I liked that he had less gray and his hair was shorter. Mm. Because I was I noticed that right away. I'm like, did he cut yeah. his hair and dye his beard? Like what? that eighties montage <laughs> sequence yeah. where it's like you got the time. Yeah. Yeah. Like shave him before look, he goes. He exactly. Was making himself look the way that he did when he mm-hmm. last saw Kylo. Exactly. Yeah. That's how they remember him. They remember yeah. him yeah. like that. So that was pretty cool. Nice little subtlety. Because you're just like, is you're not quite sure until you're one hundred percent sure where you see the older grayer uh, Luke floating on the rock, and that was cool. What did we think of you know the whole sub story with Kylo and Luke and uh, you know kind of unveiling what I, transpired between them? I love that. Yeah, me too. I thought like I, I would have been happy to see more of that in flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked the retelling of the story from different standpoints mm-hmm. because everybody's got their point of view and. Like you're, when you hear it from Luke, it's you feel one way. When you hear it from Kylo, you feel it another way. And I just, so, so which one do you believe? Do you want to believe Luke because believe he's Luke. the good guy? I believe Luke. I also believe it's I a believe little. The second story that Luke. Says. Yes. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's it could be like a little bit of a mixture of the two, but I think Luke has no reason to really yeah. not be trusted. But 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 then it's like that serves as a setup for the differentiation between Luke and Ray. Because Luke clearly has this PTSD, this discomfort with the dark side of the Force, that he's never been comfortable with it. He was terrified of it when he sensed it in Kylo to the point of, uh, you know, considering killing him. And Ray, you know, immediately senses, you know, Luke, you've blocked yourself off from the Force. You're de- like you're in denial yeah. of this whole aspect of what's there, which is, of course, you know, from the prequels, a huge part of the Jedi religion mm-hmm. that you know you are supposed to block off the dark side of the force and focus on the light and uh so luke is kind of like in this moment where it's like well i'm of this i'm derivative i'm of this flawed way of engaging the force and so ray and kylo are the different solutions to deal with the sins of the past the sins yeah. of their predecessors right yeah Neither is completely, you know, dark side or light side. Neither could really be called completely Sith or Jedi or First Order. And then you wonder, maybe would Kylo not have gone to the dark side had he not now felt betrayed by the person that was teaching him the ways of the Force? I don't know, because Luke did say that he was able to see the amount of darkness inside of him. Yeah. I don't know. Even in Empire, we saw, like, Luke had an amount of darkness inside of himself. And what were you going to say, Corcon? I was just saying that he had said, I saw that Snoke had already turned his heart. That Snoke had already been working oh, on him. Oh, yeah, that's right. He had been working on him. So. so he had already turned his heart. It was more of like he just hadn't fully moved there yet, and Luke had seen it, and that's what scared him. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, him having a lit light- lightsaber over your sleeping body, I think that would... That's enough to that yeah. That would be jarring for me too. Like, right. What the hell are you doing, man? <laughs> so both of their stories are yeah. right. I want to see a movie about that before Adam Driver and Mark Hamill get too old. Right. Honestly, like you know, maybe not like a main trilogy movie, but you know, maybe <laughs> yeah. a, a, maybe a spinoff. Six point seven five three. Like a, 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 a spinoff like Rogue One that just goes into that. Um, well, we already have six point five. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Right. 6.5? It was the uh, story of how Snoke came to be. Was that was right. it? He was a fry cook and got burned by some grease. <laughs> yeah. Fry cook and got burned by sweater grease. Yeah, yeah. This is an unfortunate cooking accident. <laughs> <laughs> Led him to the dark side. The whole um, kitchen went up in flames. One second, I gotta turn the uh, camera back on. Keep oh, no. Continue talking. Uh, but yeah, you also gotta remember how... Dark? 
how close Luke got to the dark side in Return of the Jedi also. Mm-hmm. Like, like when the Emperor is like, you know, take this, strike me down, strike your father down. And like he wanted to you know, like just kill the Emperor, but he's like, no, I can't. I think though Luke did tap into the dark side in order to defeat Vader because he used his rage to, to, to defeat him and it cut his hand off. Yeah. And yeah. what brought him back was he saw that he was becoming like him. Yeah, so, so, because he cut his hand off. Because he had had his hand cut off by him. Exactly. And it was a mechanical hand. And he looked at his own mechanical hand. And he's like, oh, I am being this. And, and that's the moment he brought himself back from the dark side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then came back to the light. Um, so that's... That's a that's a thing. Like you mentioned, Mace Windu being able to dip into that, and that's what made me thought of that earlier. Think of that earlier was a uh, any Jedi could dip into it. It'd be Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. He's I was kind Jedi. of hoping that they were going to introduce Gray Jedi, the idea of Gray Jedi, into the movies. Yeah, uh, with that, this but, by saying, you know, with him saying it's time for the Jedi to end. I was hoping that that would be him ending the Jedi religion and then trying to teach Rey more of the gray Jedi philosophy. Right. They right. might have actually been setting that up for the next movie. I think that's I think you're right about. It. I just thought of that like maybe Rey is in, is the one who sort of cultivates this new thing because she had been in communication with Kylo Ren and maybe she saw she felt something different or maybe she saw different aspects of the Force that hadn't been tapped into or um, I mean, let's go back to that scene though. It, after Snoke gets killed by Kylo Ren, how satisfying was that to watch them fight together, back to back, kicking really cool. the Imperial Guards' ass? Like that was really awesome. I thought. I thought that was a really good payoff moment. What I really liked about that sequence is, with a lot of Hollywood movies these days, it's like they forgot how to film an action sequence. Uh huh. Um, and it's nice to see Ryan Johnson pull the camera back. We get to see everybody in frame, longer cuts, no shaky cam. Yeah. And so you, beautiful cinematography. You get to see all of the movements. Uh, it was it was gorgeous. I, I thought it looked great. Um, it wasn't like the best martial arts sequence of all time, but they're all novices, of course, anyway. Yeah. See, they don't have to be, but I thought it looked really good, and I was so happy to see a properly filmed fight scene. Absolutely. You're, yeah, because it, it wasn't a fight scene made for the ADD generation. It wasn't like it, a. It wasn't like full spins of. Spins and twirls and yeah. flips. Yeah. Well, it wasn't like full it, of ju- jump cuts and, you know, yeah. and, and, hand, and handheld shots and, like, all of the, and shaky cams and, and quick zooms and, and like all the th- and crane shots like all the things like yeah. of that cut 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 aesthetic that appeals to the um, it's almost like the editor is a perf- is a performer in those uh, fight scenes mm-hmm. where like yeah. this is a scene where the editor is not trying to be a third performer or a an additional performer right, exactly. in the fight sequence. That's true. I mean, like they, they there's a there's always that famous scene from I think it's Taken Two, where <laughs> jumping over the fence. Yeah, where Liam Neeson's <laughs> jumping over the fence, and there's 17 cuts of him jumping over a fence. There's 17 <laughs> angles of him just climbing a fence and jumping over. It. <laughs> yeah, uh, t- touching on that uh, briefly. Yeah. Uh, I, I really did feel that the cinematography and the look of the film uh, fit nicely in uh, the original uh, trilogy kind of look and yeah. feel and style. Obviously, there was more CGI than we had in the original trilogy and puppets and whatever. Yeah. But it still kind of felt very organic. There wasn't a, an overabundance of CGI. There wasn't an overabundance of, of fast camera moves, etc. Uh they really dialed it back a little bit and made sure, uh, as in episode seven, that we were kind of given this a uh, more organic uh, film. Yeah. Yeah. It, the lighting reflected that, too. Mm. The lighting reflected... I think this is the the movie that has, like... there's Star Wars is known for... I mean, George Lucas really loves his wipes in the... <laughs> so, right. And I think, yeah, has, yeah. I think it has two wipes in the whole movie. I definitely like, noticed one, but yeah. I can't say I was paying that much attention. But I remember, like, the, the prequels had, like, the most wipes. It was, it was all wipes. Oh, first. prequels. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. But this one, I remember, I, I think I read about it, though, because Ryan Johnson was like, I'm ashamed to admit there are only two wipes in this whole entire movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you go, and if you go back to the 70s, and, 
he had those wipes. Maybe if he made those movies in the 90s, those wipes wouldn't have existed. That's true. Because it, it was old school filmmaking back then. Yeah. 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 So, well, so, Anna was a reflection of the serials from the uh, 1950s right? yeah. and yes. 40s where they used those wipes all the time. He was uh, uh, paying homage to, to the Flash Gordon from the 30s. Exactly. What were you gonna say, Tim? Well, so Ryan Johnson, he's you see when he got hired to do the the trilogy, um, yes. that you know starts with a fresh slate in a different galaxy or a different part of the galaxy. Yep, he's doing a whole new uh, trilogy. He's developing a whole new trilogy, writing it and uh, directing the first one, or just developing it at least. So. What are you guys' thoughts on JJ coming back now? to do episode 9 from uh, episode 7. I'm a little worried. I like Johnson better than JJ. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think Johnson's a, just a more... He's, he's better with character. He's better nah. with character development. And these movies are about character, really. I mean, they're really about visuals as well, because they pioneered visuals in cinema. But at this point, there's really not much further to go in that category. But uh, Well, who would you have rather had? JJ or Colin Trevorrow? Definitely JJ. Over Colin Trevor. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know that guy well enough to trust him with Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, I did a movie with uh, John Schwartz over the summer, who was uh, who's Trevor O's DP now. Uh, he also did like Armageddon and The Rock and all that stuff. Um, and like John was really excited about doing it. And he told us about some of the security that's involved, like even reading the script. It's like you have to go through like all these different checkpoints. Right. And, like they take your phone, they sit you in a room, and someone watches you read the script. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, he said it was insane. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was kind of looking forward to like <laughs> seeing what he might do cinematography wise with the story. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm in the same boat as far as like you know, yeah. Jurassic World was fun if you're into that. Um, of course, it was no original, but. But I'm I would much rather have JJ as well. Yeah. Um. But, I mean, I feel like there's such a heavy influence from like Kathy Kennedy and Disney over these films. Yeah. That you're never gonna get a director who's able to just bring like a unique his own style and vision 100. percent Right. So. And, cool, no, but Ryan Johnson came close. I mean, there's a lot of things in there that you can see reflected from Brick and. Uh, yeah. You know, some of his other For movies. Sure. Uh, he, and even his work on Breaking Bad. I did Looper. notice Joseph Gordon Levitt voiced a character. Oh, in yeah. The credits. yeah. I did notice that too, yeah, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of like visual style, styling that uh, he has, like in Looper, with like the things floating around. Uh, uh, have you guys seen Looper? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so. It's a great movie. <laughs> the Rainmaker, when all of those things are like floating around him. Uh, like that was very much that sequence where Ray is tapping into the force and seeing her vision uh, and also lifting the rocks at the end that was uh, <laughs> that was her I, I thought that was a great setup that earlier in the film uh, it's more than lifting there was, rocks there was, yeah it's more than just lifting rocks mm -hmm. yeah. but then like yeah. ultimately that was like one of the most mm -hmm. important things that needed to be done at that yeah. moment and that was her contribution to saving the day uh, which is, I mean, it was well orchestrated. Um, Although I, I guess Leia wasn't feeling the force uh, with her in that particular moment because she was on the other side. Right. Oh. Well, you know, she Even was just she, uh, uh, she was just coming out of a coma or whatever. Yeah, she did blow she, a door off. She, she, yeah, she, she did yeah, blow she, a door she, off. Okay. All right. <laughs> Serious force. Yeah. Uh, I liked the the demonstration of Luke's ability when he walks in on on Ray and Kylo and says stop and then blows up the entire place just like the he just blew up the entire her little shack. Mm -hmm. you know that, that scene was awesome, yeah. but I immediately thought of those caretakers shaking their yeah. heads. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Like, ah, oh, damn. Yeah, got to rebuild that thing. Those those are great little comic relief uh, characters I thought. Uh, mm -hmm. What'd you guys think about the caretakers? Yes. I like the caretakers yeah, a lot. Real good. Yeah. I did feel bad for them because, like, you know, these two people keep destroying their shit <laughs> that they hold sacred. Yeah, um, I felt they were slightly just, better comic relief than the little the uh, bird characters. Yeah. I like the bird characters. I though. love I, them. I, I, I oh yeah, they were lovely. The bird characters. <laughs> like the whole scene where like Chewie's trying to eat them. That was, yeah. that was so funny. I thought that was great. And then like. You know, they become like Chewie's little buddies now. The, yeah. the, the caretakers, I actually have really like, what? Are they still like the Jedi salary? Like, what are they, like, are they, are they related to the Gungans? Because they kind of look like frogs. Yeah. I like, mean, they just. But, yeah, but, but the, the little bird character, he, it's already dead. 
Yeah. And so, like, whether Chewie eats it or not, it's still dead. <laughs> no, but Chewie didn't. He Chewie did not end up eating it. Yeah. He so maybe like, Chewie he up, like, like Chewie is vegan now. I'm yeah. How do I do this? <laughs> maybe um, Chewie could have helped Chewie. out more if he had gotten some nourishment. <laughs> it's all Chewie. He's spreading mm-hmm. veganism throughout the galaxy right now. Um, I love the so Luke and R2. What did you moment. guys think that about the uh, the acquirement of blue milk? Oh, oh god! Oh gosh! Is oh that, yeah! Is that where the blue milk came from? Oh. No, no. Yeah, that that scene yeah. where mil- where uh, like Luke milking is milking the, the whatever it is. The oh, island. I'm just Space happy counting. that in in finally there's some nudity in a Star Wars movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they got away with it. That was great. Yeah, and the sequence be- with R2 and you were mentioning R2 oh, yeah. and Luke. That was actually nice. That was a nice mm-hmm. callback to the original with Help Me Obi Wan Kenobi mm-hmm. and Only Hope. Yeah. Oh, that was a cheap yeah. move. Because yeah. they couldn't have R2 yeah. in there too long because he would upstage BB 8, but just right. for that part, it was nice. To- well, that's... and it's, it's nice to know that he still has that in his memory drives. He never deleted it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I love the line when. Um, I don't remember who said it now. Uh, told uh, C3PO to oh, Leia, wipe that worried look off your face. Because yeah, obviously he's always face. got that same <laughs> worried look on his face. <laughs> I like that Poe had a little bit more to do in this yeah. film than he did in Force Awakens. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed that character. Right. I felt he yeah. was underused or even like, like why was he there in Force Awakens? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like to actually like now he's a character was, was nice. He was supposed to be killed off in Force Awakens. They, they see, when he crashes uh, the TIE fighter with Finn, right. that was when he was supposed to die actually. Yeah. But then they brought him back later in the movie. Um, which I thought was cool. I, yeah. I, I liked him in this movie a lot. Um, any other? I like his I like his story arc because you get to see him move from just a, you know a trigger happy flyboy to an actual military leader. Yes, that was like a... you see that entire arc in this movie. And they're grooming him to sort of succeed. Han Solo. Uh, well, Han Solo and as a as a character ish, but also like General Leia's role, yeah. like her position. He's he is like the next in command in. in... Well, Leia did pass the baton off to him at the end there when they're in the cave and he says follow me and they all look at her yeah. and she's like what are you looking at me for follow mm-hmm. him that was great that was a great moment after oh, previously she had or maybe it was Laura Dern's character mentioned that uh, or insinuated he's not a leader yeah. uh, and then, then Leia is all like hey Follow the leader. Yeah. Right. Although she still did stun him earlier after blasting the door down to take her <laughs> to take her ship. Yeah. You know, the, I think the only character I was really disappointed in was, or as far as their story arc was concerned, was Finn's character because I feel like he didn't really change much from one or from one to two, from uh, seven, to, seven eight. to eight, yeah. and like he, he was just kind of like the same thing. So I, I really right. hope in nine he has more of like an arc. But he did want to become a hero. He did want to. He was about to sacrifice himself uh, into the. What well, was Rose it? had already uh, the blaster cannon blaster recognized cannon. him as a hero, and he didn't even want to accept the label. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And you, could, you could say that he was showing he's not afraid of the First Order anymore. Because in the first movie, like that's all he wanted to do is get away mm-hmm. from the First Order. He's terrified of ever going back. Yeah, and in this and movie, at the beginning he kind of, of this fought one, yeah. his fear and overcame that. But there, I agree, there wasn't much of an arc with Finn at all. Right, um, it was just neat seeing him because I like his character. I was wondering if he was going to turn, like if he was some sort of sleeper agent or something. Because uh, when Huck said we have we have them at the end of a string or something, You're like we've got he was the, um, the inside man. Like a, like a mole. A mole. I was wondering. I'm glad they didn't do that, but mm-hmm. I was like, I hope that the, that's not what. Happened. Well, I they thought... really didn't expand on what what was this string they had. I well, it was... it was like the tracking device. Yeah. Well, that's what I gathered. But, but they, I thought it was Laura Dern until they explained it. it. Yeah, true. I thought she was going to be turn out to be working for the. But first I thought about the same thing about uh, Sean Astin in Stranger Things too. So. <laughs> hey, <laughs> that he was working. Double for the... spoiler alert. <laughs> 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 We're not spoiling that. So, any other standout moments that you guys think are? Uh, How about Leia using the same type of ray gun to stun Poe that was used, used to stun her in A New Hope? Good point. 
That is like little, shit. Little, I didn't even notice that. Like that. Yeah. yeah it's like the blue circles. Just everybody to know what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's it like... makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. No, it makes more sense that she would stun him like that yeah. because she likes him. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense to me, even still to this day, thirty some forty years later, why the uh, Empire didn't kill her and they stunned her. <laughs> right. Yes, I did see that yesterday morning. And I, I noticed like the stun, like the blue circle that, like, that comes I mean, out. It's the, the cliche yeah. of yeah. any movie. Did you where, see, I was like, like why did they where the good guy gets stunned like instead edition? of destroyed special when edition. the bad guy yeah. clearly has the opportunity? I left. I'm sorry. <laughs> we were just talking about <laughs> the, I, I walked out of the scene where they had Jabba the Hutt uh, yesterday. Anyway, what were you saying? <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say, Korga? Oh, I was going to say like... Um, for all of the Star Wars movies, we've seen like the Emperor or the Supreme Leader when they're at the height of their power. Yeah. Or like in the prequels, he's gaining power, but he's still in the term of master. Like he has apprentices. He's not an apprentice himself. And in this movie, it felt like we were witnessing what uh, Palpatine mentioned in episode three during the opera when he was kind of lamenting over how Darth he ends up killing his master Plagueis, yeah Plagueis, to get power yeah and in this one it's kylo ren doing that to snoke to mm. gain power because we're kind of seeing like the the beginnings of what could be the next emperor or yeah the next trilogy or supreme right. leader kind of thing instead of seeing them at the height of their power to begin with that's true that they were seeing the rise of the rise of ren yeah. The rise of ren yeah. Which will fall next movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I think what made. I don't think he'll fall next exactly. movie. I think this could be uh, like maybe. I don't know, but like, you know, we had the original trilogy where we meet these characters and they're at, like you said, like Vader's at the height of his power, and then we got the prequels where it was kind of building to that. Maybe we're building to that now, and then the next three films will be. They're sort of like. Yeah, I, I disagree. Yeah. I, I think the first trilogy, obviously, it was Vader's story arc. Mm -hmm. The uh, prequels failed in having a villain with a story arc. We had Darth Maul at the, in the beginning, yeah. and then it was sort of the Emperor, but of course the Emperor has to continue on because... So you get Count sad. Dooku. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and Dooku was stupid, and uh, I think Kylo Ren, this is his story, and I think by the end of the next movie, it's got to have a, a resolution, resolution of some sort. Right. Yeah. I think so. I, I mean, it... It's gonna be weird to, like, where do we go? I mean, I answered, I asked that question earlier, but like, where do we go from here in Star Wars? Like, it, now, episode what you, nine. What do you think about critics generally reviewing the the film very favorably, but some fans, you know, it's it's a divisive film and among fans. That's an interesting question. I haven't so. looked at any reviews yet, so I thought it was I'm great, but there's definitely a vocal. I mean, I guess there's a vocal minority on the internet that complains about everything. Well, I just did. Like right before I joined you guys, I was filming a uh, video with my friend Matt Kohler for my spoiler review, and he hates the movie. He hates oh, it. Oh, wow. Okay. He hated both of the new ones, but he's also a huge fan of the old canon. Mm -hmm. So all of the old books and uh, those story arcs, and he doesn't connect with the new characters at all. And mm. so he can't find anything that he really likes he found the new movie boring and I, so we had a, a good half an hour discussion on that you know finding out that really he just can't connect with the characters because he's so hung up on the old canon right. that he can't uh, suspend belief or just attach himself to anything new mm -hmm. and he's not going to ever like the new movies and it's okay uh, but the people that hate the new movies, they're just not going to be able to connect with the characters. And if you can't connect with the characters, you're not going to like anything that happens. That's a good point. I, actually, overall, for me, my overall, I guess we'll do like overall impressions, but uh, it, I left it just sort of not knowing what to think of it. I, like, I enjoyed myself. I remember laughing throughout. I remember enjoying specific moments. And, but I felt there were like, there were like really great moments. And moments that didn't really sit right, again, like Leia coming back to life in space and then bringing herself... Like going a, full Superman? Yeah, going full Superman. I was like, uh... But, I was like thinking, but five years from now, I'm just going to look back and go, oh, that was the moment when Leia came back to life. And, and like not even going to 
sort of think about because if you think about Empire when that came out when when Vader spoiler alert says no I am your father uh, p- audiences hated it from what I read they like they hated it they didn't believe it they had to wait three years mm-hmm. for Return of the Jedi to validate that claim and well, they, that happens with every trilogy you you in hindsight everything is better just because you have the full picture right now we don't have the full picture mm-hmm. yeah you know once we've seen the third movie just like you know the force awakens a lot of people didn't like that but there's a lot of things that make sense now because we saw the second movie yeah yeah and by the time we finish the third movie the first two movies are going to make a lot more sense as well so we're in the middle of a story it's like we just put a bookmark two-thirds into a book and we're yeah. kind of waiting now or eight ninths <laughs> obviously when lucas made the original star wars he didn't know he was going to be given the opportunity to make yeah. a sequel or a trilogy so he kind of had to wrap that first movie up in a nice tiny little little bow yeah uh when when he did empire knowing that there was going to be a, a follow-up to that he was able to kind of create uh, these storylines that didn't necessarily have an ending and yeah. made us be like, what the F is going to happen next? How can you leave me in suspense? <laughs> and I was missing a little bit of that from this movie, knowing that there's going to be a third one that's going to wrap everything up. There wasn't that definite... Uh, spot where we're we're heading where are we going with this mm-hmm. it didn't leave it me knowing where we're going that's and, that's and I'm I a thought. little bit like I, I wanted I wanted less answers in this movie than what we got yeah I guess it, it kind of has that same problem with like season 4 of Breaking Bad when it's like okay well okay Gus Spring is dead yeah. like what, what, do you, what are we going to do in season <laughs> oh, 5 now we, we kind of have to like oh, restart man. everything and like find, so there is kind of like that, that issue with episode 9 where uh, there isn't really a clear trajectory, yeah. but at the same time, I feel like you know it's uh, you know it, it's good to leave it open ended. I thought it was a good movie. I thought it was uh, just all the pieces fit together reasonably well. It was very synthetic. Mm-hmm. It, it it drew from lots of different characters, and um, it's hard to say that it really had. Uh, single leads it really had five six seven strong leads that each got relatively equal screen time that's true mm-hmm. yeah um, there was a lot of going on different places different locations happening constantly yeah but would you, anybody disagree that Ray is our main hero here no no, no. Ray's, Ray's definitely the main hero she's, she's the main the, protagonist yeah for sure uh, now the original trilogy though had the bonus of knowing what direction they were going to go in because Lucas originally wrote the script for Star Wars was just too big and so when he got funding for the first movie he was like well I can't turn all of this into one movie it's too much I'll just do the first act yeah and then have the Death Star explode and that's what he did and then if I get money I'll do the next two so he knew where he was going to go already anyway with this one we don't know and even the creators kind of don't really know where they're going to go with it because too many things have been happening with yeah, the that good, and, and that Leia dying that they have to change stuff last yeah. minute. Yeah, so that, that goes into the corporate. The writers know where it's going to go. Yeah, that really, yeah, that goes right into the whole corporate business of filmmaking mm-hmm. uh, that I mentioned a little earlier, where obviously the filmmakers are now they're watching shit like this, they're listening to everybody, they're hearing what the fans want to see, want to hear, want to know, and then they're going to tailor the scripts to that rather than having, say, a set plan from from the beginning. Yeah. I hate that. I hate the fan service. Right. That, <laughs> I, it, it's very it's very crowdsourcing. I want something bold. I want something like a statement. Well, yeah. that's why I'm excited about the new trilogy that Ryan Johnson is going to do, because yeah. he's writing yeah. the trilogy yeah. before they're shooting right. it. Yeah. So yeah. they're and, gonna, just like the original trilogy, they're mm-hmm. going to know where they're going in the third movie by the time they start shooting the first scene of the first movie. Right. But you got to wonder how much maybe might change, say, after the first movie comes out, that they're like, oh, people like this, people didn't like that, let's rewrite all the rest of these two scripts. Well, it's also like the oversaturation level. Like, are people going to be yeah. tired of it by that point? I mean, I love Star Wars. I, I was such a Star Wars nerd as a kid, and I loved it. And then, like, the prequels came out, and, you know, there were the prequels. But, <laughs> but like, I, I remember, like, being there opening night, 
uh, to see Phantom Menace. And I was like, I can't wait. Um, but I, I feel like getting a new Star Wars movie every single year. Yeah. Like, is it going to make us tired? Because, like, I'll be honest. I was not necessarily looking forward to The Last Jedi. Yeah. I saw the first trailer, and I thought it was a carbon copy of the first trailer for The Force Awakens. Like, it hit yeah, the same yeah. beats. Right. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, whatever. My friend, my friend Matt agrees with you. That was one of his points in the video we just made is that he's feeling the Star Wars fatigue on Yeah. Yeah, I, I I'm feeling that too. Like I wasn't as excited for this, obviously, as I was for episode seven. But then again, episode seven was like the first in a long time. time yeah, we didn't know that it was. was yeah, you know, the the, the idea of seeing a new Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah, we get stars from Teague from just one Star Wars movie a year, and yet we're watching three or four Marvel movies. Oh, I yeah, <laughs> I can't wait for I, these last set of Avengers to be done so I can yeah. never watch another one. <laughs> but, I've barely seen any of those Marvel movies, and I'm already sick of most of them. Uh, I will say, though, going back to like great. the love of Star Wars and how it's embedded in our culture... As much as I wasn't looking forward to it, or like not expecting to like it, or like, oh, here we go yeah. again... When... The words a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away come up. Yeah, you yeah, just get so, so pumped, ex- and then that awesome. John Williams theme hits. Yep. and goosebumps, and you're just like, okay, I'm in this yeah, to win it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. ugh, the crowd magical. was like deafening yeah. at the first showing yesterday. It was just so. I felt that way about uh, Rogue One, where like, okay, here comes this Star Wars movie that's not actually a Star Wars movie. Yeah, and like, I was like, ah, I I don't know about this. But ultimately, it was like a really fun and good little uh, sub movie in the universe. Yeah, it was a smaller movie. I, and we I got, love, to, see, I and we got to see Darth Vader kick ass, which, which doesn't maybe line up was with all we ever wanted hope, to but... see in the first place <laughs> in any of those movies. Yeah. That's true. Um, what do you think of the Han Solo movie? No. I'll see it. See. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll be Again, there opening day. <laughs> I'm kind of skeptical. Very skeptical. Because Harrison, yeah. Harrison yeah. Ford was such a specific actor. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Is like there can only be one Han Solo. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, like John John Glover as as young Lando. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'm stoked about that. That's perfect. I was, yeah. I mean, that. but the question is, is he going to pronounce it Han or Han? Han, old buddy. Because he calls him Han. I just I was watching Empire yesterday, and he's like Han, Han, and like everybody calls him Han. Yeah, it's funny. Well, like, you know, I'm sure we all have friends who like people just consistently mispronounce their name. Like, yeah, I have a friend. His name's Ben Bennett. She's the co-host on our podcast, and everyone calls his or pronounces his last name Banesh. Even some of our closest friends who we've had for years, like they still call him Banesh. Yeah. So, that's true. I don't even know what you're talking about, Nat. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, not, not. I used to, I, yeah, I had a friend who used to call me Nate or not, and, and Nate or not. Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. Anyway, so final <laughs> thoughts on on Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. We just did. We just give. <laughs> I mean, was that the final thought? Uh, I thought it was fun. R- rating. What's your rating out of ten? Eight. Eight. You know, I, I honestly, on the scale, I might even give it a nine. A nine. A nine, nine point five. I really liked the way it came together. I give it an eight point one. I'm going to go seven point five, and I'm also going to add. I think, at least with Disney involved, that this is potentially the best we're going to get of like the new trilogy. I think so too, actually. I think this is the bar. <laughs> this yeah. is. Uh, do you like it better or not better than The Force Awakens? <sighs> I'm going to go better. I gave Correct. it an A- better. from my scale, so okay. I guess you would say I, yeah. you like it. I might well, yeah, say what was, Korokan, what, what was your score? I said, uh, I gave it an A-, minus, so I guess it, in numbers it would be probably an 8.25, uh, and I think it's better than Force Awakens. I okay. would agree. I think it maybe is a little bit better than Force Awakens. Yeah. At, at least in particular, that it wasn't such a, say, a carbon copy yeah. of the previous trilogy. Right. Alex Santiago so, says it, it was weird. Let us know why you think it was weird, Alec. Yeah. Uh, but, but, <laughs> why it was weird. I yeah. do see a lot of callbacks uh, yeah. from sure. Empire to this one. Yeah. And I had mentioned last night after we'd seen it early 
that the uh, whole casino scene was very reminiscent of Bespin. They went to Bespin. They found a Lando who ultimately right. uh, became the guy that uh, yeah, turned him in because he got a deal from the Empire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was Deals very right on the nose. All the time. <laughs> I'll say that the casino scene was the reason I gave it a 7.5 instead of an 8. Like, that whole planet, I just, I didn't like it. I thought it was a little right. too prequely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some, like, the one CGI character who kept sticking coins in BB-8. Mm-hmm. I was like, all right, this is cheesy. Uh, then, like, the elongated, like, space Kentucky Derby sequence where they're, you know, freeing the horses no, and but, riding through the fields. I thought that added a, <laughs> a significant backstory to the corruption in the Empire and... The nation, in, in a way that Croissant didn't in the prequels. Yeah, yeah. Like to to see an elite place that's more like a you know a mm-hmm. um, a resort island. Uh, I love the I intent thought, behind it, and I, I, I do love the story. I just thought it was executed kind of poorly. I know. Yes, I'm, I'm there with you. I, I think it was uh, the next. casino to Episode Six, Jabba's Palace. Yes. But, yeah. But. I kind of I equated it to in the special edition exactly <laughs> episode four creature cantina in the special edition <laughs> <laughs> in the special edition with the extra CGI's. Cork, what was that, Corkon? I was gonna say, do you think that's something that could come up in the third movie of what Finn went through with all of that, finding out that the people making all the money are selling weapons to both sides? I hope so. And, yeah, I don't think so. That, uh, I you think know, they've uh, they're just pawns, and then that the guy being you know betraying him and saying it's just business. You blow him up today, they blow, blow you up tomorrow. tomorrow blah, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I think they that made that the point. Third movie, it's going to sour him or change his character. I don't think so. I think they made that point very clearly, and I think that's uh, over and done with, and they're going to move on. Fair. I would like to see it explored a little bit more, as far as like what relationship is there really to this yeah. to these people, like is. Somebody, like who's playing who kind of I mean maybe this whole trilogy though uh, the whole theme is everybody's got a little bit of good and bad in them and maybe you're all working a little bit on both sides and nobody's actually uh, it's not black and it's not white yeah, yeah there's grey and goes back right to the grey Jedi grey Jedi hey, grey Jedi <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got a question uh what did you love about it? What did you hate hate about it? Is there anything that you particularly loved? For me, I I loved uh, I loved the moment with the back to back Kylo Ren and, and Ray fighting. I loved uh, I thought the the crate sequence looked pretty cool, um, but I you kind of got that from the trailer. Um, but I, I I loved pretty much a lot of the stuff with Luke. Uh, yeah, I thought Luke did was was the highlight. Can I say that I love Mark Hamill's performance? Yes. Mm-hmm. Because it was, without a doubt, his best performance in a Star Wars movie. And Tate mentioned yesterday, maybe ever. Maybe ever. <laughs> it ever might be. Any performance Mark yeah. Hamill's ever made. Do we yeah. count the Joker in the Batman animated series? Live action performance. That's okay. pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> Voice acting is acting. Uh, also, yeah, we should start the campaign for Mark Hamill's best supporting actor nomination <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for uh, The Last Jedi. I don't know. Did you see Richard, or Richard Jenkins in The Shape of Water? That was pretty awesome. I didn't see that yet. Oh, it's so good. I'm going to go watch that. Um, My favorite part was the fact that they killed off Snoke and did not explain where he came from. Right. We've all talked love- about this before, that we all kind of have a little bit of a problem with not knowing where, who the fuck is I don't, Snoke. I don't at all. I, I like want- the idea of just a bad guy who's a bad guy. I think <laughs> it goes in line with the Force being, again, more egalitarian, more accessible, like, yeah. not a super unique... I guess... Well, go ahead and finish your thought. Oh, no, I, was, I, was... Um, I guess my issue with that is, like... I'm okay with like Snoke being somewhat obscure as far as like what his original origins were. Yeah. I just want to know how did Snoke corrupt Ren if he was under Luke's watch? Jim Ren? <laughs> That's in such a third movie. Maybe they do that actually. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you can. Have... He didn't get much explanation. They didn't show any of the Knights of Ren. They just kind of that's true. went over some of that, so maybe we get more of that backflash storyline in the third movie. That could be cool. They should develop that because Luke does say he, he left with a, a bunch of my students. Or, and... I know from personal experience here, when I was in film school, one of the very first things I did was I wrote a script, 
And my whole script, the very idea why I made this script is about a serial killer, was that ultimately at the end, why did the serial killer kill all the people? And I'm like, sometimes we just don't know why these people do what they do. Right. Sometimes we just don't know. Yeah. And everybody that read my script was all like, well, why the fuck do they do that? I want to know. <laughs> everybody yeah. wants to know. Who the fuck is Snoke? Who yeah, like, is Snoke? We gotta know. Like I said. They may not ever say because they did set it up in the movie to where anybody could become powerful from anywhere and it doesn't right? matter what your lineage is. Yeah, so like Taylor's not just, saying yeah. where he comes from just falls along the same lines. Yeah, I don't, I don't care where he came from. I just want to know how he corrupted I don't know if the masses Tyler. can buy into that. Yeah. Them asses? Like, mm-hmm. uh, the, our, us few select... <laughs> Me. Uh, I mean, I think the masses can buy into anything if you look at the, the, the movies just that are successful. <laughs> or the sign of the, or Donald Trump. Right. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> so Alex Santiago says a lot of things like... Any of, any of Nathan's uh, family who supports Donald Trump, they can vouch for it. Uh, yeah. A lot of things that happened with Snoke and Ray and Kylo's relationship, Luke's attitude toward Kylo seemed very unlike how he saw things in Return of the Jedi. Uh, yeah, I mean... I suppose... Well, I mean, because yeah. he's changed. He's, yeah, yeah. he's changed very much. He was naive and had yeah. a very different perspective. And I think this shows the journey of Luke's character I, um, uh, from where he was in his perspective on the Force and Return of the Jedi to yep. now having a much wiser critique of yeah. the Jedi Order and the Sith and that whole dynamic. Yeah. I think if you look at Luke in a whole, ignoring Mark Hamill's performance... Uh, the Luke character from uh, one movie to the next has definitely grown and changed more yeah, than yeah. maybe any character we've ever seen That's true. in well, certainly, any Star Wars movie or or group of movies. And second would be second would be Chewbacca now becoming vegan. Yeah. <laughs> but, and a great pilot. But no, and a great pilot. you're right, Corey, because like, you know, like, having watched like the prequels and the originals and all this, like, it seems like all the Skywalkers are kind of whiny. Um, but yeah. but we're like young Anakin based on what George Lucas showed us with the prequels was always very like oh, I just want to get my time he and was my super whiny the super entire whiny. time but yeah. so is Kylo like he's like super you know you know what but I think he turned a corner to where now he's not so much whiny but Luke is the only one that's more like pissed off and yeah. what, what you touched on with like early, earlier you mentioned like the PTSD that Luke has and all this um the fact that he's seen the dark side, how it can corrupt, like his father, even though he was able to turn away from it in the end, and how he got close to it in like you know a select scenes in Empire and there at the end of Return of the Jedi, and then seeing it in Kylo, it's like, is his bloodline like, like is how strong his family's connection to the Force is more subject to going to the dark side? I mean, yeah, it I makes mean, sense that he'd be like, all right, well, there's another Skywalker who's or Solo who's turned to the dark side, let's just end this now. We'll yeah. call it a Skywalker, because it is. Yeah. yeah. Despite the last name. Mm-hmm. Right. Call it the Skywalker gene. It is the, yeah, the Skywalker well, they're gene. they're all very emotional. Yeah. yeah. They're all very emotional. Let's yeah. talk, before we end this whole thing, let's talk real quick just about, like, the most important element of all. And it's that Schwartz ring. Is this Schwartz <laughs> yes. ring mine or yours? <laughs> The, uh, the rebel ring at the oh, end. Oh, the rebel ring. You're right. Oh, yeah. the Schwartz, the Schwartz be with, be with yeah. you. <laughs> who, who gave him that ring again? It was, uh, it Rose? was Rose. Rose's yeah. ring. Rose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now is this kid just a symbol for the the new rebellion? I think so. Together? Hope. Yeah, New Hope. The New Hope? He's the new... Episode 9, New Hope. I don't think specific... no, He's going to be in Episode 10. He's like 10 through 12. He's going to be the lead. Right. <laughs> he's Ryan Johnson's new lead character. Yeah. Uh, flash forward. A little, little, little Easter egg. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. A little Easter egg. Well, like maybe we're know, joking now, but maybe he really is. would go back to the Knights of the Old Republic. The Knights... Of... Yeah, I feel like they should just do a whole new era of Star Wars and, and not necessarily... Continue. No, like, they don't have to use any of the characters from Knights of the Old Republic, but at least go to that era. Yes. Yeah. I think that would be a great idea for a TV series because they're doing they're developing oh, yeah. a t- they're developing a TV series, and I think if they do it on a Game of Thrones level of of depth of character and all different people from different regions and different sects yeah. of 
of, uh, of folks that we actually care about, yeah. I think that mm-hmm. could actually work out. Uh, I don't understand. You don't and understand. Do hey Siri. Despite the execution <laughs> of the prequels, <laughs> yeah, right. Ignoring yeah. the execution, obviously, there's three movies, six yeah. plus hours of movie, where we basically know where it's going, and that's a problem. What, the um, first six movies? Uh, yeah, with the prequels. Oh, the prequels with ruined. With the first three movies. With the prequel three movies. We know where it's going, so that's a problem. Obviously, with these new movies, we don't know what's yet to come. Yeah. And in any other production, Star Wars or anything else, if we don't know what's yet to come, there's a sense of what's yet to come. Yeah. yeah. And that's with the really prequels, deep. we already know where the end goal is. So right. getting there has got to be ultimately, like incredibly entertaining or unsuspected of like oh I didn't know that's how they could have got there yeah so yeah there is no destination it's completely it's open wide it's wide open for episode (laughs) 9 so we don't know what's going to happen that's in two years uh, or is it a year and a half two years oh it's two years years. it's going to be Christmas it's going to be during Christmas well uh, or is it isn't like the third one? Didn't they say it's going to be in May? Like the old one? I, to be? Well, I heard that they were... Solo is going to be in May. Yeah. Oh, okay, and then That's I think it. JJ, when he came on board, he had them push it back from the following yes. May to the following December. Chris, yeah. So thank you guys for coming on the show and talking about Star Wars with me. This is awesome. This is an epic spoiler review. We've got Corey, Tay, myself, Aristotle, Full Throttle, and Nathan. And Nathan, you've got a podcast, right? I do. Uh, we tried and we failed podcast check what's it called we tried and we failed we tried and oh. we failed this is they failed. and you guys <laughs> obviously know this channel tay where are they where can they find you i just i don't, I don't the, know go, I google tay's on day yeah <laughs> you'll, you'll find them yeah, you'll find them. <laughs> uh, Corey. i'm looking for work i'm available yeah, yeah. On, anyone needs a gaffer gaffer Boom. great gaffer i need a gaffer in here <laughs> but the lights could use some work yes yeah, it's, it's very true <laughs> I need some I need some good lighting no much more glossing that over yeah for sure uh, I did get Wi-Fi bulbs though I'll show you that after this oh yeah fancy <laughs> but thank you guys for joining us on this Star Wars The Last Jedi review thank you Korakon where can we find you I don't want to forget about uh, you two channels Korakon Nala for Indian movies and Korakon Nerd for American awesome and subscribe to his channel subscribe to my channel if you like this video, like it. If you're here, like it. If you're seeing our faces, just, just like the video. And uh, share it with your friends. I'm Aristotle Full Throttle, your bro in the fro with the no. Wait, I'm your bro with the fro in the no. Y'all can, uh, <laughs> y'all can uh, touch, touch the hair if you like. It's going to take me a second to like turn this off, actually. So <laughs> I didn't really time this well. May the force be with you. May the force be with y'all. And happy holidays. Happy holidays, that's true.